you talk about what you what you brought this year? What your uh, we presented results from an Australia-wide uh, randomised switch study, mm -hmm. uh, where which had its origins in mid 2005, when we had Epsicom or Covexa as we call it, mm -hmm. and Truvada coming to market, and one was a blue pill and one was an orange pill, and really nobody knew what to do, uh, and so we set up a, a study where patients. Uh, on suppressed on treatment, including nucleosides, switched to one or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was sort of a, like a simplification study. We really didn't have any visions that it would show differences in uh, efficacy, in virological efficacy. So really the way it was set up was to look at safety. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there was a few sort of key design um, strengths of the study, in, in hindsight, at least in, in one that we took a very active role in collecting all the toxicities and sort of comorbid diseases and serious non-AIDS events that have subsequently sort of come to light a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we found was that yes there was no difference in virological efficacy mm -hmm. but that uh, patients who were in the uh, EPSICOM group had significantly more serious non-AIDS events and in particular mm -hmm. more cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think we only got to see that, one, because we decided to look for it properly, mm -hmm. and two, because we did a two-year study and not a one-year study. Mm -hmm. and, and time and again I see studies reported that, personally, I think are too short, that really don't tell us that much. Mm -hmm. And I think the time of the one-year study is probably coming to an end. So do you say you did not actually put forward, this was not an objective of the... Of you, the no, no, it, was, it wasn't... Right. a. I mean, not in the sense that once the SMART data came out, it, but we, we did, we knew that there were lipid differences mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the drugs, we knew there were bone differences mm -hmm. and kidney differences, so we decided to look at all of those mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. actively rather than... So and every, you could do that because the way the study was designed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, um, not that I'm patting my, ourselves yeah. on the back, but I, I think it, is, it became a strength of the study mm -hmm. when you compare them to other switch studies that really just focus mm -hmm. on virology and you know they all show yeah. so these this day and age they also pretty similar efficacy although uh, the uh, the Merck study from yesterday was perhaps an example where that didn't happen but mm -hmm. uh, most of them most regimens now work so mm -hmm. uh, what we're left with is picking the safety differences and the tolerability differences. So, so you're, you're saying that it really is it does make sense to have studies around two years especially when you're trying to determine certain outcome like we're telling people to take yeah. treatment for decades yeah right you know? well that's, that's oh, i think thing. one year is mad now you today are probably telling i hope i don't know maybe i hope you're saying you may be on this regimen that i'm providing for you now 10 years 15 mm. 20 years and that, that's something you probably never would have thought of yeah. well it was there in, in the last what five years ago maybe six years ago yeah i mean i can remember saying i, I can remember a patient who i still look after saying to me in 1995, I think, you know, my cholesterol's a little high, Andrew, you know, should I be worried about that? And he had 100 yeah. T cells and very right. high viral yeah. load, and I right. said, if you get a heart attack in 10 years' time, we should both be very happy because you're still alive. Right. right? Yeah. And he's still alive, he hasn't had a heart attack. Right. Uh, and, but, you know, he was wondering what this is going to be like for five or 10 years, and mm -hmm. even now we don't have much experience at 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the bar has really become quite high for the side effects, because oh, that's so, yeah. because that's what we're really worried about now. We we know we can get to undetectable, it seems, for, in most people. Oh, you know, first, but, second, and even third regimen. It's it's. But not can the person endure the time with that regimen because of the potential? And that's why we say the bar is high. Anybody that comes out with a drug today has got a lot of rigor to put out there, and, and side effects should not be a, a part of that, that regimen. Well, I mean, I have troubles taking a course of antibiotics for 10 days, and yeah. I take my hat off to somebody who can take pills Forever. day in yeah. and day out. Yeah. 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 Right. So uh, I, I, um, I know that you come to the, uh, the lipodystrophy conference that, that is, is so-called so each year, and I, I, I can maybe, maybe ask you to, to um, spring into action and, and throw a few things from that maybe that, that were also, since we didn't really have a chance to talk to you at that, and you might want to bring some of that forward. Um, uh, there were uh, probably a, a broader range of uh, presentations at this meeting mm -hmm. that I'd seen for a while. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, there was a nice presentation from um, Dominique Castagliola about mm -hmm. uh, cancers in the French uh, database, mm -hmm. showing, I think, what perhaps many of us in, in sort of intuitively mm -hmm. know is that most of the cancers now are, are non-AIDS cancers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the non-AIDS cancers are actually worse for you than the AIDS cancers, right? You die more yeah. from non-AIDS cancers, uh, and there's a higher incidence of them in patients with HIV than in patients mm -hmm. without HIV. So we have to start thinking beyond the lymphomas and the KS, and we have to start thinking about things like mm -hmm. lung cancer mm -hmm. and melanoma, for example. Do you think we'll cut down as we presumably, I, I presume, that because of treatment becoming more like uh, for prevention, um, more and more people earlier treated will be less likely to drop too low to where they become uh, candidates for immune reconstitution syndrome, and that might be part of the... Well, I think, I think IRIS will yeah. be less of an issue uh, yeah. with time. It's certainly in, in you know, resource wealthy countries like mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the cancer issue, both in the HIV and the non-HIV setting, such as transplantation, is clearly related to immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. So if we are treating earlier, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the logical guess would be that cancers will become less prevalent with time. I was just talking to John Bartlett, and he was not sure whether we were going to take a giant leap, a big step, and get way out there with early, early treatment. Treat, uh, I guess they determine that a person's positive, then treat immediately, uh, or whether we take a segmented moving up and up and up the ladder. Uh, I think it will sort of be incremental. Yeah. My own perspective on this is that it's all early because mm -hmm. we're deciding to mm -hmm. wait, you know, one year or three years in a 50-year disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. if you're actually yeah, yeah. not waiting yeah, for yeah. new drugs to come along, it's, yeah. I, I think it's, it's uh, not an enormous, um, uh, difference mm -hmm. uh, and it's in fact getting somebody ready to start is to me more important than... Is there anything if you had a magic wand and you were waving at what you'd like to see happen that that is going to take maybe a, a great deal of conviction from an activism that just isn't quite as robust as it used to be? I, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, happening more uh, and more. Uh, if, uh, if uh, perhaps not so much in my country, um, but I think in many and, and in yours, everybody in the United States who doesn't know should go and have an HIV test mm -hmm. because it's the, mm -hmm. it's the unknown patients who transmit the virus and mm -hmm. who are the ones who are going to get sick. Every, the, you know, starting at 350 or 500 is a bit immaterial if the average mm -hmm. person is diagnosed at 200. Uh, is there anything else you'd want to bring forward that, that uh, before we close? Well, there was uh, a few presentations yesterday that mm -hmm. might be worth a comment. So there were two presentations on cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. two cohorts, the, again the French cohort mm -hmm. uh, and the DAD study, mm -hmm. uh, which for the first time have looked at individual drugs and their contributions, possible contributions to myocardial infarction. So again, all the traditional risk factors apply. Mm -hmm. Being older, being a man, being a mm -hmm. smoker, being diabetic. Um, the drugs that seemed to fare worst in, in the analyses were some, but not all of the protease inhibitors mm -hmm. um, uh, and some of the, the nucleosides. Mm -hmm. So the fabrins and the viropine looked fine. Uh, of the current crop of protease inhibitors, the one that got looked the worst uh, was uh, lopinavir. Um, Atazanavir wasn't in the analysis, so we'll just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. uh, in the nucleosides, abacavir was, uh, you know, singled out in both studies. So yet another study that's sort of found a contribution of abacavir, mm -hmm. although the French found that it was only in the first year of exposure and after that it looked okay. Mm -hmm. um, the studies reported that tenofovir was uh, not a risky drug. Uh, although in one of them, the actual relative risk seemed quite similar to a back of ear, but mm -hmm. the confidence intervals were wide, which made me think that perhaps with more follow-up, we'll get a clearer picture of whether there mm -hmm. is a risk or not with tenofovir. Mm -hmm. But I suppose at the moment, we'd say there isn't. Mm -hmm.